Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News. These days I feel a lot like Oswald Cobblepot on Gotham telling anyone who will listen that a war is coming. And that war is between Marvel Studios and Warner Brothers DC Properties. Now the reason I still think the war is coming is because DC hasn't really arrived on the battlefield yet. Man of Steel was almost like a scouting party with the bulk of their forces not slated to arrive until 2016. But when they do, as Kevin Sujihara recently revealed, it will be in crushing wave after wave. I mean, if you think things are intense now, just imagine when these movies have finally arrived and are battling it out at the box office and there are real stakes on the line. Right now we're in a propaganda war, but when you actually have box office numbers coming in and the, both sides are going to... Uh, planning to produce so many films each year that they're not going to be able to totally avoid each other at the box office. And then, of course, Warner Brothers uh, is also extending the battle over into the live action fairy tale market. And that's another interesting thing about this uh, impending war. It's spread beyond just Marvel versus DC, a very popular matchup in the comic book community for quite some time, but it's morphed into uh, Disney versus Warner Brothers almost. And it's creating that same level of kind of animosity between the two studios, at least uh, in terms of media coverage and, uh, and fandom. I mean, it's, it's fun to have a matchup. And so I think that, uh, Mar uh, again, Disney and Warner Brothers have all of a sudden found themselves in a battle royale thanks to the comic book properties that they both own. Uh, and I think there, you know, there is a little bit of envy and animosity because both want to dominate. And I think both have a very good case of, uh, to dominate. Both are strong contenders. No one here is really that much of an underdog. I guess DC has a little bit of the underdog status right now, but I think that their properties are a little bit better known than Marvel uh, originally. So I think that kind of evens the battlefield. And, you know, they are they are fighting for uh, really, you know, top names to star in each of their films. So that's what's going on right now. As I said, there's a propaganda war. Who can win in terms of hype and get people the most excited? I mean, every day it's like a game of one-upsmanship between the two studios' publicity departments for Marvel and DC to the point where I think it's creating some fan fatigue. We'll talk about that in a moment. But also in terms of casting. Uh, when Benedict Cumberbatch was announced yesterday for Doctor Strange, a lot of people's response was, you know, what a coup for Marvel, they've got him on their side. You know, obviously implying that DC missed out on an actor who is quite popular with his, uh, his you know, very strong cult fan base, but at the same time, uh, you, you know, the demographic that I think is the target for these comic book movies, the base that they need to build on. And of course, Benedict Cumberbatch is a major force on the internet with a lot of fans online, and internet traffic is very important in this propaganda war. And actors really are, I think, getting to a place where they have to choose a side, just like fans have often for some time now felt they've had to choose a side between Marvel and DC. Uh, but actors definitely do. You can't appear in both worlds because they're at war. You can't fight on both sides, which is, again, an interesting development for Hollywood as a whole to see this comic book kind of battle that's been going on, as I said, for decades between Marvel and DC expand to Hollywood. Suddenly, if you're an actor and you sign on for one of these studios, a whole other group of films is now unavailable to you. And I think to some degree, you know, um, actors, when they play a really big uh, character that everybody knows, it's hard for them to go and pick up another one. But still, they could go work for that studio. Well, Robert Downey Jr., of course, has a, uh, a producing deal with Warner Brothers. Uh, but largely, you know, you're expected to pick a side. And also, once you're there, they cast you in other projects that they have because you're part of their team, bringing in, again, Disney and Warner Brothers into the mix. Look at the Jungle Book over at Disney. Idris Elba is doing a voice there, and of course, he is in the Thor films as Heimdall. Uh, now, I said that uh, the propaganda and the publicity uh, might be having something of a negative effect. Uh, and I think that's true, and I'm wondering if we're starting to reach that. We'll discuss it even more in the, uh, a little bit in the second story, or the results of this uh, going too far. But uh, one of the things I thought was very interesting yesterday with the Cumberbatch news is that uh, even though it was reported across the internet as fact, uh, it wasn't officially confirmed by Marvel, but very strong uh, source and a strong enough, you know, deadline originated the story, strong enough for everyone to pick up the story that this was it. It wasn't like Joaquin Phoenix where he was in talks or being considered. It was the decision has been made and negotiations have been, that, that stage has been entered. And I think that's why people felt, uh, the media felt, including myself, that it was pretty close to a done deal because, again, uh, deadline reported that both sides wanted to do this. Uh, they just needed to hammer out the contract, and that's why some, somebody over there felt they could leak the story. But a big reaction from uh, a lot of BTT viewers and across the internet was, you know what, I'm tired of this, especially with Doctor Strange. 
tell me when you have a definitive contract in place and this person is going to be playing the role. But I have to say, with the way that leaks have also become a problem, especially for Marvel as of late with the Avengers Age of Ultron trailer and now this Benedict Cumberbatch Doctor Strange news, who knows if this is what they had planned to make for a big splash at their press conference later today, uh, their mystery uh, event, and many people are saying they're taking a page from Apple and the way, uh, of course, Disney and Apple are, are have a very strong relationship together. Of course, Steve Jobs uh, was a founder of Pixar, and when Disney bought Pixar, Jobs became uh, part of the Disney board, so there's a lot of crossover there at the companies. Uh, so it makes sense that they would take a page from Apple's playbook and do these, like, uh, press conferences. Maybe this is the new wave. Marvel's like, we don't. We have so much news to deliver. We don't want to wait for a comic book convention, uh, or even when one of our movies is coming out. You know, Marvel is trying to make a splash when they have nothing really to promote beyond the, the brand itself, uh, which is interesting. They're not trying to get any other property to ride that wave. So that's another change in the way publicity is done. Uh, but so, the, so they're being undone by rumors, and the question is, at what point will fans go, I'm sick and tired of hearing about, you're considering this, you might do this. Uh, but, you know, it, it's, a, it's a vicious circle because, and some people said, oh, Grace, why are you reporting this? It's not 100% confirmed. And it's like, hey, as I've said before, hate, hate the game, not the player. Uh, everybody ran with this story, and it's irresponsible of me uh, from a professional standpoint to not, you know, be in the mix. And I think that some of you might say, well, oh, well, I would counter that it's unprofessional to report a story that's not 100% uh, confirmed. And I would say the news business has changed, especially at least in entertainment news. Although I think you're seeing a similarity, uh, you know, what, what a lot of people criticized, um, you know, the actual news for, like cable news, uh, the very... Um, sorry, an excellent expose was handled with that in Anchorman. I thought it was really well done. Not maybe not expose, because we all knew this was secretly going on, but I guess a commentary or a critique was leveled against the news industry in Anchorman 2, which I thought was fascinatingly brilliant. But, you know, at the same time, you have to acknowledge, you know, you as I often like to say, because, you know, a lot of people feel, oh, let's make up our own rules for news or for Hollywood. We've had that discussion before. But you can't make up your own rules. If everybody, the whole group of the bulk of people have decided to play a certain way, you can't go over into another field and play by yourself. You might enjoy the game more because it's by the rules that you like, but you won't be in the actual game that everybody's watching. So I think that that's also what Marvel, the boat that Marvel and DC find themselves in. They go, well, you know what? I'd prefer not to report that I'm considering casting these people for Suicide Squad, but at the end of the day, I'm looking at the trades online, and Marvel is posting multiple headlines a day at this point, and DC says, DC says I need to get out there. Uh, I need to get into the fight and remind people about my slate of films. Now, that's my other thing that I want to discuss before we move on to the next story. Why is nobody else playing this game? Uh, you know, it's almost like uh, Fox and Legendary, I think those would be the big studios who would want to compete here, are like, you know what, I don't want to play it. This is irresponsible. But the thing is, the result of that is they're not a part of the conversation. Uh, you know, Apocalypse had a little bit of a salvo with the Tom Hardy casting rumor, but that died really quickly. So where is that? You know, uh, even Channing Tatum tried to say, oh, hey, you know, the Gambit solo movie, he did that in his interview for the Book of Life. You, saw, you might have seen that story surface, but it got no traction that they're working on a Gambit solo film. And maybe and maybe it might be that, you know, there's something about the Marvel versus D ma uh, matchup that's just magical in terms of fans and media. And it's interesting to see these other stories not getting any traction, but not even really trying to. Fox needs to get more in there. They've been very quiet about Fantastic Four. They're saying because, you know, it's very special and different and they want to launch it properly. But come on, I mean, you're not in part of the conversation. And then also Legendary. Legendary had a really great announcement um, at uh, Comic-Con with their uh, Kaiju expansion with uh, Skull Island. And then, of course, the Tom Hiddleston news was pretty great when that was announced later on. That was in the news cycle. But, you know, they're not out there consistently um, playing the game. I mean, they're doing a very good job at the box office, so I don't know how necessary that is right now, and they're very good at advertising a film. They have a very impressive slate coming up. But still, uh, I don't know why the rest of Hollywood is letting Marvel take over the entertainment news cycle, Marvel and DC take over this entertainment news cycle. I mean, look at today. Marvel has a mystery press event. They dominated yesterday with the Doctor Strange, uh, you know, semi-rumor, which was pretty much confirmed. And then tonight they have the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. scene that's going to air, uh, you know, uh, from Avengers Age of Ultron. And, you know, the whole thing could tie together, but that's just dominating the news cycle all day long, the way they've timed it out. They could have had a press, press conference closer to when Avengers Age of Ultron, uh, that scene aired at, at, um, with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but no, they're doing it this morning, I think, to try and drive traffic to this episode. So we'll see what the announcement is, but it's just... The whole Hollywood landscape is changing in terms of the business, the way you publicize a movie, the way fans watch Hollywood, and it's all thanks to Marvel and DC. And I'm just curious what you think of these developments and 
uh, if they're good, if they're bad, and if you think other studios should get in here and fight. All right, so let's uh, talk about Benedict Cumberbatch a little bit. I've been thinking about him, uh, and I'm surprised. I have a, a little bit of a different take on his casting after having th I've had a few hours to think about it. But I'm also surprised with the way the news cycle has evolved. Now, of course, every time there's a news story, the media has to find an angle, uh, you know, something to think about. Uh, and I think that with Benedict Cumberbatch, the angle has become, is he too safe a choice? Uh, and I don't think that's a, an angle that Marvel would like to see take shape. But too bad, I think it's taking shape. I saw a number of you talk about this yesterday when the news broke. Uh, I've speculated to myself that I don't think anybody wants this Doctor Strange role because they had much more interesting choices in the mix. And I think Benedict Cumberbatch is a real, hey, you know what? I'm tired of looking for a Doctor Strange. Nobody wants it. These negotiations are taking too long. People are dragging their feet. I'm dragging my character through the mud as a result. Let's just get a fan favorite in there. He wants to do it. Let's sign him up. And I think that very much might be uh, what actually happened. But you know, when the Hollywood Reporter runs a story about is Benedict Cumberbatch too safe a choice, uh, that's scary. That's scary for the film going forward. And I thought about it and thought about it. And this is my feeling about Benedict Cumberbatch as Doctor Strange. I feel Benedict Cumberbatch might have too strong an image at this point to disappear into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. One of the great things is that everyone they've cast has become that character. When you, Even Robert Downey Jr., because his own personal uh, life is so close to Tony Stark's, has morphed into Tony Stark. When you see Chris Hemsworth, you're like, hey, it's Thor. When you see Chris Evans at this point, you're like, it's Captain America. I think Scarlett Johansson has done a good job disappearing into her role as Black Widow. Mark Ruffalo, all these actors, became the characters they were playing and they became, you know, uh, as again, they disappeared into the group to serve the purposes of the group. And I think that's not only because they cast some unknowns, but with the more well-known characters, like uh, actors like Mark Ruffalo, Scarlett Johansson, etc., you have a situation where they've been cast against type. Even Paul Rudd coming up. You know, you wouldn't expect Paul Rudd to play an action hero in a comic book movie, the lead no less, and here he is. And I think that is different enough that it it redefines the character. Also, Zoe Saldana, she's green. She looks, you know, they've altered her appearance enough as Gamora. Uh, Chris Pratt, you know, had some fans, but he's really, I think, become Star-Lord. And I think when people see him in Jurassic World, they're gonna be like, hey, look at Star-Lord. And I think that's a credit to Marvel and their casting to date. But Benedict Cumberbatch is Sherlock. He already is closely associated and has morphed into his own character that he already plays. And that character, as I said yesterday, is very close to Doctor Strange. So I think that you might not be able to cast off his image as Sherlock, where you're really going to have a situation where Sherlock is in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I have some concern when he has to mix with the group, which of course he will because that's the name of the game with Marvel and all comic book movies at this point. Is it just going to look like fan fiction, like someone found a way to write Benedict Cumberbatch into uh, an Avengers movie, into interacting with these other characters that, you know, really do blend in? Uh, and it's going to seem like maybe a Saturday Night Live sketch or something like that. Uh, and I think that that is a little bit scary. And that's, that's my biggest concern, besides the fact that I think Benedict Cumberbatch secretly might not be able to play to a large audience. I think there's a very good chance he's just simply not a blockbuster actor. We'll see. We'll see what happens. I mean, but if Marvel can make anyone a blockbuster, but if anyone can make anyone a blockbuster actor, it's Marvel, right? But I'm curious to what you think. Now that you've had some time to digest Benedict Cumberbatch as Doctor Strange, are you still excited about it or are you more excited about it? It really was met with some ex intense excitement yesterday, but also some disappointment, people feeling it was a little too on the nose. So I'm curious, as more time has gone on, how do you feel about it? Uh, and do you think that he really can blend? Do you think that you'll be able to not see Sherlock when you see Benedict Cumberbatch, but instead instead Doctor Strange, especially because, you know, they're both going to have black hair, they're going to have, you know, the same setup where they have an assistant, a faithful assistant, as I discussed yesterday. There are a lot of similarities. And also, what does that mean for Sherlock if uh, Marvel successfully wipes away that image for Cumberbatch? I think that it helps Sherlock quite a bit. And whenever you see Benedict Cumberbatch, you think of that show. That's like free publicity for them. So I'm sure they don't want to see Marvel hijack that. All right, so that's the second story of the day. Now, sure enough, the third story of the day, and I tried really hard to find another non-comic book story, by the way, but there just simply wasn't, weren't any to be had. And that speaks, again, volumes about the entertainment biz, uh, news business today. Uh, but this is a good one, though, and I like this. And this is from, again, DC. And this is about the idea that they're trying to put together a Krypton TV show, you know, kind of like a companion to Gotham. Uh, and David Goyer is in charge of it. Uh, again, I feel David Goyer is a great idea man, so I hope that's all he's doing, you know, just kind of putting together the series Bible and they'll let someone else take over. Uh, but David Goyer is apparently spearheading this uh, initiative to have a, a Krypton television show. And yeah, I think that would be great because, you know, very quickly the DC Cinematic Universe is becoming Batman heavy. Uh, the, you know, the Batman casting rumors about uh, Robin, the Gotham TV show, 
uh, Suicide Squad draws off of, uh, largely Arkham, you know, Arkham Asylum characters. So, you know, they're really kind of veering in the Batman direction again, which, I, of course, we can all understand because it's the more successful of the two properties. But they need to keep Superman uh, strong. They need to build that up. And I think a Krypton series could be an interesting way to do that. Also, because Krypton just isn't very well explored. Uh, there have been a few really great classic stories, but my favorite is, of course, Alan Moore's For the Man Who Has Everything. I've actually put a link in the video description where you can buy a trade. It's about $12 on Comixology. You can buy it digitally. that includes that story. And it's just a wonderful story, very tragic, interesting story that does a great job of showing how the Justice League characters can be used uh, with depth and intelligence, which, of course, is Alan, or Alan Moore's trademark. Uh, but it's a great story, and it really focuses on Krypton and what it means to the Superman mythos. And I, I think that if that's done correctly with the television show, it could be really interesting. Also, it won't tie in too heavily into the movies, or will it? We'll get to that in a moment, because, of course, most of those characters don't carry over because Krypton explodes. And one of the problems I think people might be having with Gotham is they're like, okay, well, this is the Riddler, this is Penguin, but I know they're never going to go into the movie. Uh, you know, this is Bruce Wayne, but Batman doesn't show up. And he's so little, it's going to take years, literally, for us to get to anywhere near, uh, like, uh, even, like, early Batman stages. Uh, this is, like, you know, like, uh, you know, baby Batman, you know, Muppet, uh, Batman babies. That's kind of like uh, what, what's going on a little bit there with Gotham. But I, I think, by the way, Gotham last night was very, very good. It's, it seems to be turning around a little bit. I was close to dropping the show, but I was really, uh, my interest was really reinvigorated last night. I thought it was a fantastic episode and a lot of forward momentum. They were having a hard time, I think, moving a lot of their B storylines forward uh, in favor of these, you know, A storylines of the week. But this time they finally started, I think, to do a better job building the mythos of Gotham. But with the Krypton show, I would say that it would be a lot. It would be a very smart move to focus on Kandor. Kandor was the capital city, as most comic book fans know, of Krypton. And Brainiac, a classic uh, Superman villain, shrunk the city down and stole it for his collection, which is why Kandor was able to survive the destruction of Krypton. And I think it's important to focus on Kandor because I don't know if the audiences are going to be into a show where they're like, "But wait a minute, doesn't I know how this ends? Everyone's going to die." So what's the point of this? I mean, they could play in with Jor-El, you know, uh, Superman's parents, but then I think you fall into the problem with uh, Gotham, where you're like, oh, but wait a minute, you're never going to get to the movie. You know, this can only go so far. Uh, it, it's a little distracting that way. So I think that that's why uh, maybe they shouldn't focus on uh, Jor-El uh, and, you know, um, oh, I'm forgetting Superman's mom's name. So I think it's like, uh, I, I, for, I forgot it. I'm sorry. That's how horrible her character is. I think everybody loves the joke. I loved the how it should have ended for Man of Steel, which was a great comment where uh, Jor-El made a little uh, copy of his DNA so he could be with his son forever. And, and his wife was like, you made a copy for me, right? You made a copy of my DNA and persona so I can stay with our son too. And he was like, oh, later. This is awkward. <laughs> so I just think that they need to, it would be great to see that character maybe built up better to, do, to, to, to be more powerful. But anyway, the problem with this is, is that if it's Candor, therefore you do need Brainiac. And Brainiac's a great character. It could be very interesting. Uh, you know, it would be a great uh, Walter White almost for the uh, Krypton TV show. But if you work so hard to develop Brainiac on TV, does this mean he'll never be able to go to the movies? Because, uh, well, he can go to the movies, obviously, on Krypton, but, you know, be in the movies. Because DC has made a, quite a point of saying, you know, obviously with their double casting of The Flash, that our television properties are not going to cross over into our film properties. So, you know, I don't know. I'd be nervous to take a character like Brainiac, which I think would be really great in the Superman movies, especially because it's one of the few villains that would be fresh to the movie-going audience at this point, uh, and, and, you know, relegate him to TV. You know, and because there's the danger that you'll either do too good a job, and then everyone won't, won't want a new Brainiac, which I think is a problem the Flash might run into. Uh huh. Accidental pun. Uh, and then, uh, then if you do a bad job, everyone will be like, "Well, I hate Brainiac. What a lame character." So we'll see. But I do think the Krypton show is a really good idea. I think it's one of the better ideas I've seen come out of DC in a while, and I'm pretty excited to see how it develops. Which Krypton do you want, by the way? Do you want the Man of Steel Krypton? Which is pretty bleak. I don't know if people would want to watch that for a long extended period of time. It also looks a little too much like Gotham, don't you think? I would prefer to go the brighter, happier route, uh, you know, the City of Science. A little like Asgard. Everything's just Asgard. Some the other day was like, why did you say Wakanda was like Asgard? I'm like, because it's kind of like Asgard. Well, I mean, it didn't used to be, but the way the Marvel Cinematic Universe has reimagined Asgard is the city of science that we just don't understand yet. Uh, but, you know, I think that that's the kind of Krypton I would like to see. Because it is a city to some degree of the gods, right? But very, very interesting, and I think it's a great idea. Now, on to the viewer question. This comes from Vizigobi. Vizigobi. And Vizigobi says, Grace, question for you. 
Is the effort and focus of studios more on generating buzz than uh, crafting good films? Can two good weeks of movie attendance in North America recoup uh, production costs and then it's all gravy overseas because they will watch anything? Well, I wouldn't say that about our friends overseas, uh, Z, uh, Zgobi. I know you might be frustrated sometimes to see movies that you don't feel do should do well, do well thanks to that overseas box office. But I think uh, a lot of uh, moviegoers overseas are, uh, you know, just discovering, uh, you know, uh, 3D and, you know, they're, they're at the beginning of the way. And I think that's very exciting. And of course, uh, we should embrace our foreign friends in the box office because they're saving a lot of movies and therefore Hollywood itself. Uh, so I think that that's, that's not the case, but I think you're right about headlines. Headlines are incredibly important because you want to get people going to see a movie right away because that that's going to, you know, forecast the entire run of a film. If nobody knows about your movie, no one's going to see it. But if your movie's not so great, if everybody goes to see it opening weekend because of the buzz, uh, unless it's absolutely horrible, you'll be able to ride that wave for the rest of your release. Now, look at Gone Girl. People are very divided on Gone Girl. For instance, if you go on Fandango, you'll see a lot of really negative reviews. I was surprised because to hear a lot of you talk about it, it's a perfect movie. It has no flaws. Uh, we got into a big battle about it over in my Gone Girl review in the comment section. But I, if you go over on Fandango, it's not rated a must-see by viewers. It's just a, a go, not a must-go. That's how they differentiate the films over there. So I was like, that's interesting. I thought for sure this would be a must-go, considering how, you know, uh, you know, rapidly this film was defended over in, you know, my review. And I looked at the comments and I was, you know, I, my initial feeling about that film was correct that it's really div divisive and that some people love it and say it is a must-go and some people are like, do not go. And that's how it ended up with just merely a go overall on Fandango. And so even though there's that negative uh, feeling that exists there, because the film opened so strong and they did such a good job with the publicity for it and crafting this mystery and showing that Ben Affleck does have some star power, etc., people are still going. Even if someone says to them, I didn't like this movie, they go, well, it has a lot of buzz, it's doing well at the box office, I want to see it for myself. And that's what publicity can do. It can create a situation where people go, you know what, it's the bandwagon effect, it's the lemming effect, I should go and check this out, everybody else is going. So, and also, as to your comment about concentrating on making good films, it's hard to make a good movie. That's why it's so extraordinary and deserves so much recognition when someone does make a good film. Because there are so many moving parts in Hollywood. Hollywood's so political. Uh, you know, not only, I wish that everyone's end goal was to make a good movie, but then there are people who are like, oh, you know, I, I sorry, so my neighbors uh, outside, I don't know if you can hear them or not, uh, going, I guess, going to school uh, or, or daycare based on the sound there. Uh, but anyway, um, so yes, so you have a situation uh, where there's politics, uh, you know, so this producer decided, oh, hey, I have a great idea for the movie and I'm going to make everybody implement it, even though it's not what's best for the film overall. So they have to overcome that. They have to ride that, you know, they have to see what they can do. It's an imperfect uh, sit, uh, set up. And that's why it often creates imperfect films. So the box office is so, import is, is so important. It's what makes people go and see the movie. Look at Birdman. Birdman, I feel, is a perfect movie, but I think their publicity uh, department is letting the film down and it doesn't have the necessary buzz. And as a result, people aren't going. And its second weekend was really weak. And I think it's, it's going to slide off the map unless it gets more award nominations. It's just going to be di to disappear and not be seen because Michael Keaton isn't a big enough star and Edward Norton isn't a big enough star. Alejandro uh, Inarritu isn't well known enough. And the publicity campaign didn't do enough to try and draw people in in spite of those elements. And that's just what you have to remember. Also, you know, I wouldn't put it all in the studios. Uh, I wish that moviegoers sometimes would search out the really good movies, but, you know, that's not the case. Moviegoers say, hey, I don't like Michael Keaton. I haven't seen Michael Keaton in a long time. I'm not going to go. It's just, an, it's, an, it's just human nature, and it's why someone like Emily Blunt can be labeled, labeled box office poison, even though she does a great job. There's something about her that makes people say, I'm not going to go see it. I'll wait to rent it, or I'll just skip it altogether. So that's why publicity is so important. And, yes, that two-week wave, and also with the way the movie theater... Um, distribution system is set up in terms of revenue, the studios get the biggest percentage of the box office in the first few weeks that a movie plays. The longer it plays, the more money goes to the theater. And of course, they're not uh, as enthusiastic about ensuring that the theater gets its money. So that's uh, that's kind of a, a little bit better uh, you know, viewpoint of the landscape for Zgobi. Uh, I hope that fills in some of your questions. Thank you so much for your question. Uh, everybody, please write down what you think of today's top three stories and the viewer question. Anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow, any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.